Good morning, everyone. It's good to see a bunch of friendly faces here this morning. Um, I haven't song led before a group like this probably in about 20 years or so. So, um, so I'm not doing the whole service, so, so you can have a sigh of relief. Jerry will be picking up. I'll do the, the opening song, I'll do the closing song, and uh, hopefully it'll be a beautiful noise uh, in praise to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all these things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Okay, there we go. Morning. Every once in a while I do that to myself. Uh, so here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be having our lesson, which is a proud faith. So we're continuing our proud faith series, and we're talking about a faith founded in hope. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter makes this statement. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We have a hope that we have received. We need to be sure that we understand our hope, that we can articulate our hope, and that we know exactly where that hope comes from. Because we have a hope that is founded in Christ, which offers us so many amazing things. And that's exactly what we want to be talking about today. As well, here in just a few minutes, we'll be having our Lord's Supper. And I've got my pocket buttoned where I have the little example I can show you of these things here. So we have those in the back of the auditorium or over by the entrance. If you haven't grabbed one already, go ahead and do so because in about 15 minutes, we'll be having our Lord's Supper. And so at this time, I'm going to turn the service over to Steve Woodside, who will do our opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, this beautiful day, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. Be with us through this service and the rest of the day. Also, thank you for sending your Son that we might have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
most fascinating passages to me is Zephaniah 3, 17, which says, The Lord your God is with you. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will rejoice over you with singing. Did you catch that? God will sing over you. He loves you so much that he sings over you. How cool is that that the creator of the universe sings over his children. Now, as equally fascinating to me is the idea that God loves your voice. He created your voice. It's unique. He loves your voice and wants to hear your voice. Did you know your voice is just as unique as your fingerprint? In fact, experts refer to it as the voice print. It's totally unique to you. And God loves your voice. He wants to hear your voice. If God, the creator of all things, sings over us, who gives us life, breath, and all things, what an honor it is for us to sing to him this morning. Psalm 104, 33 says, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I'm breathing. As long as I live, I will praise my God as long as as I can until I see him face to face. Oh 
Jesus said, after he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to him saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you. 
have the ability to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53 is amazing prophecy that is given that lays out Jesus' death upon the cross. If you go and start at verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, with grief, or a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Isaiah looks forward to the coming Christ, and he does this a number of times. In fact, when we were talking about this morning, Isaiah is the most quoted book in the Old Testament by Jesus. Of all the prophecies, it's, it's the one he's going back to most frequently. He lays out for us what is going to look like for the life of Jesus. When Jesus comes, he fulfills what has been said. And he paints this picture of what it's going to look like in order to bring about salvation from sin, to bring about a cleansing of our iniquities. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to be getting into, coming to earth, going upon the cross. And what's more, if you'll turn with me into Philippians chapter 2, Paul depicts the humility of Jesus. In verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that as the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus knew that he was going to be dying upon the cross as all of these events had unfolded and this became news to mankind. He knew what he was going to do. He had left where his place was in heaven, willingly took the form of a lower being, that of man, for the sole purpose to be able to free us from our sin. And we just take a moment and realize the gravity of that. He suffered to fix our problem. It's so once a week we come together we worship God, we sing praises, we offer up prayers, 
and we partake of the Lord's Supper, a moment in which we have to remember the importance of what Jesus had done and his selflessness in doing so. This wasn't something that happened to him. This was something that he chose to experience for us. We should be ever grateful that he had made that choice on our behalf. If you haven't done so, like we'd said before, we have these here in the back. And so you have the opportunity now to grab one. We'll take out the bread and I'll offer a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful that you had put together a plan of salvation, that you were willing to give us your son, that we may be able to be freed from sin, to be able to be justified and have a right relationship with you once again. We know how much it took in order for us to be able to receive this and just how brutal the experience of Jesus upon this cross was. We at this time, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, ask that you bless this bread as we think about all that had been done in order to bring us to this point. Lord, it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. We also have the fruit of the vine. Let's go again to God in prayer. Our awesome God, again, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for this blood that was spilt and shed to be able to cleanse us. We know that there's a great deal of suffering that came to spill that blood. But we know just how important it was for us and for our salvation. We ask that you bless this fruit of the vine as we partake of it in remembrance of your son who had done all that to bring us into a relationship with you. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. part of our worship to God we do through giving and we set up a number of ways to make that as easy as possible first of which you can go on to the website followthebible.com and follow the links there in order to be able to uh, offer your gift otherwise you can go and text give to 714-450-7010 text word give to 714-450-7010 We also have the boxes in the back over at the doors that you can be able to drop off your contribution or you can mail it. If you wanted to mail it, you'd be mailing it to Orangeview Church at 13211 Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California, 92843. So we set these up to make it as easy of a process as possible. And so that's your opportunity to be able to do so. In just a couple minutes, we're going to be having our lesson on a faith that is founded in hope looking at the type of hope that we have and what it means to us. And so we'll do that here in a couple minutes, but we're about to take our five-minute break. During that time, you'll be able to get up, stretch your legs, to be able to meet with one another, see what's going on in each other's lives. And so we want to give you the opportunity to do that. We'll also have up here during that time the kids' pack. So if you have a little one that wants to... uh, to be able to do something during the process. We have, they correspond with the lesson to kind of try and keep them in, engaged. And so we'll have those being distributed up here. 
We also have our digital bulletin. You can text OV Weekly to 94, excuse me, 94,000. And then as well, we have the printed versions of them up here. So if you wanted to grab a physical copy, we have those up here. And so at this time now, we'll take our five minute break. So today we're continuing in our series on a proud faith. As I said before, it's a faith that is founded in hope. I'll go back to our reading this morning was 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The expectation is that we have a hope. And so the question then becomes, if we're going to be making a defense, if we're going to harbor this hope, where is our hope? That's where I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. In fact, in my New American Standard Bible, I, every once in a while I like to look at those little headers and just put down the fact of the resurrection, the facts of the resurrection. Paul makes this statement. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. His statement is we have, we have hope. We have hope in Christ. We have hope in his life. We have hope in his death. We have hope in a resurrection. I mean, it's very frequently, too, something that we look at in the resurrection. But it's not just a, a hope for the future. It's a hope in this life. But when it comes down to it, our hope is founded in Christ. And that's what I think we need to understand. Who is Christ? Well, as we look at the character of Christ, that's exactly what I want us to do today. There's a couple of things that we should keep in mind, because when it comes down to Christ and the way that he is depicted throughout the Bible, there are a few things that we see show up within Christ. He was anticipated by prophecy. He actualized that prophecy, and he accomplished salvation. Now, I know those may be a little bit of an awkward way to put it, anticipated, actualized, and accomplished, but let me tell you, I like alliteration. So we laid it out this way. But the point is, is that there was a Christ that was being looked forward to, and then that Jesus came and he did exactly what had been laid out 
And in all the things in which he did, it accomplished a result. It accomplished salvation. So we look at the aspects of Christ and, and we see there's, there's a few things I want to look at because Christ lived, he died, he arose, and he also is coming again. And we can break these down into their parts and we can understand how that accomplished salvation for us, how we are able to hold on to a hope which is founded in the Son of God. If we want to be able to make a defense for the hope that is in us, this is where we come to understand just what has happened in order to give us this hope. He's the Christ who lived. The anticipating of that is that Christ lived as was promised. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it states, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Like Isaiah had looked many times forward to the coming Christ. This is that moment where he's saying that a child will be given to us who is going to come through as living in the form of man. He's going to be God as man. The wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And then Christ came and he actualized that life. And he had done so in a way that was perfect. He had actualized that life because he had lived according to the law. In fact, when he had come, that was something that he made very clear in his Sermon on the Mount. He did not come to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish the law but to, or the prophets. I've come, I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Or as the New King James puts it, I'm not a dot or a tittle. Because the iota, that's, that's the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. Not the smallest letter is going to be moved. He's going to come through and he's going to fulfill what had been brought forward. And that's exactly what he did. He lived out that life perfectly according to the law of Moses. And because he lived, and because he had lived perfectly, we now have a high priest who is able to bring us that salvation. Hebrews chapter 7, 26 through 28. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later, then, then the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus could not have fulfilled the role as our intercessor, as our high priest, as the one who had come to live to bring us salvation if he had not lived according to the law perfectly. But that's exactly what he had come to accomplish. And that is exactly what he had done. He had lived a life and he had lived a perfect life. He had lived a life free and devoid of sin. And because he had lived that perfect life, because he had done so without corruption, it caused the next result, the Christ who died. He had died in order to bring us forth our salvation. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53, 4 through 6 states, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Isaiah looked forward to what it was going to take for Christ to bring his salvation, he tells us that he was going to be pierced for us. That he's going to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity. This was the looking forward to that moment, which, which is such an awesome moment in our history, in the fact that he had died there upon the cross, but it is also such a tragic moment in the same respect. But what he had done, as Isaiah looks forward, is the ability to remove sin through death. tell you, I don't know how I always manage to do that, but I will get us back on track. So when Jesus came, he actualized that very thing that had been prophesied by Isaiah. He took our sins upon himself while alive upon the cross. He went up onto that cross to bear our sins. In Matthew 27, 45 through 54. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said this, or said, this man is calling Elijah. And one, of, and one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When, this, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. And as that depicts those moments, he's there upon the cross and there even still mocking him, saying, let's see if Elijah will come to him. You know, he's going up there, he saved others, let him save himself. But he goes up on there, onto that cross. In that moment, in which he is taking our sins upon himself. He gives up his spirit to God and dies upon that cross. And for what reason? In order to accomplish our salvation. He accomplished a new covenant. A new covenant with the people of God. A covenant which is able to bring redemption and reconciliation for those who would believe. For those who would be in a relationship with God and obey the gospel. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15. It says, therefore, he, that is Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal, in, in, eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus, through his death, creates a covenant and through his blood seals that covenant in which we are able to receive that redemption, that reconciliation. And in fact, is laying out that it even 
covered the transgressions that were committed under the old covenant. He did not only bring about salvation for the people who come after Christ. He had brought salvation to all those who had died in God. He had died in order to bring salvation to all mankind. And so he is the Christ who died, offering us salvation. And just as he had died, he is the Christ who arose. Didn't just end with his death there, but he had come back. And this is exactly what David refers to. I take us to Acts chapter 2. That's, that's where Peter, there on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, as he is preaching the first sermon, of the first Christian sermon, there before the Jews. And he refers back to David in 33, or 23 through 29. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pings, pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, life, which will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and, is, and his tomb is with us to this day. When David presented that statement in the Psalms, is saying that the Lord is not going to let the Messiah stay within the realm of the dead, within Hades. And just as we see in the fulfillment of those statements, as Peter himself is alluding to, this is exactly what happened, is that Jesus had died and he had resurrected and he lays that out. These are the events that happened as he's looking towards what Peter, or Paul, let me get the right name out, David had said. David had made that statement that this was going to happen. Peter says this obviously wasn't David talking about himself because David is still dead and buried. But that's not the case with Jesus. Because Jesus presented his resurrected self just as promised, just as said was going to take place, so it did. In John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, it says, as we go to Thomas, and now I look at Thomas, and you have doubting Thomas, and I always feel so bad for Thomas, because he's not the only one who expressed this feeling of doubt. But he is the one who probably was the most vocal about it in the way in which he depicts putting his hands in the holes of Jesus. And Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the, mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I mean, we weren't just looking towards the fact that the Son of God was going to come, come of a virgin birth. That is an amazing thing to have accomplished 
all of itself. He wasn't just going to die in order to give us salvation through his own blood. But in addition to that, he was going to raise up from the dead. That he was coming back. And as we see him presenting himself there to Thomas, he had done exactly that. He had come back again. And as Paul lays out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 20, Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection. He, he's, he's the first of the harvest, the first one to come about. But that also promises, as you see the first fruits, it gives an indication of what's going to be coming from the rest of the harvest. That's what the first fruits is. That's, that's the first marking in this. And Jesus is the first fruits. He's the first one to do this. But it also tells us there's more to come. And so Paul says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. That's it. We, we have the, the resurrection of the dead. He was saying, if, if, if it's only in this life that we have to look forward to, then as Christians and all that we are to do and give up within this life in the way that we are supposed to act, we of all people should be pitied. But that's not the case because Jesus had raised from the dead and the result of that resurrection is that we may have confidence, we may have a hope of our own resurrection. So he's the Christ who lived, died, and arose all according to the prophecy, to the life that was lived, all working towards the same result, salvation for God's people. That's an awesome thing that has come about for God's plan of salvation. All of this is accomplished through the man Christ. But in addition to these parts, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Or the life, the death, and the resurrection, excuse me. Is the coming back. The Christ who is coming. Because this as well, now we're not looking towards the Old Testament in this, but Jesus himself had laid out for us of his, his coming again. He foretold the day when it was going to be taking place. And so the prophecy had been given of the of the second coming. It's in John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's an awesome day that we have to be able to look forward to as Christ gives us a place of our own within the Father's house, within God's house, as he prepares a dwelling place for us. But his promise is that he comes back again to do just that. And when it takes place, we're looking at the actualization of it, of course, it has not happened yet, but when we see it, we know that it's, it's going to happen like a thief in the night. That's how it's depicted for us. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord, and we remember when we look at this, actually, in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 8 and 9, Peter's addressing that, that God is coming, that these things, that Christ is coming, that these things are going to happen. And it's not slow as many of us look towards slowness, but instead is taking place in a way that God can fulfill his desire to have as many as possible come to repentance. He desires for every man to come to repentance. In verse 10, he says, The day of the Lord will come like a, thief in, like a thief, and when the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be buried up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. When this all comes to pass, this is the way in which it's, it's going to look, and it's going to come not in a way in which we are expecting because... It's coming like a thief in the night. It'll happen all at once, and we will not see it coming. 
and all things will be exposed. That's a daunting thought as it lays out for us the burning up and uh, dissolving of the heavenly bodies and the earth and the works and all that's done. We think about that and that, that can be quite heavy in what that lays out. But we don't have to fear. Why? Because we have that hope. We have that hope in knowing that when Jesus comes, he's taking us up with him. A hope in which we have to be able to hold on to. And when Jesus comes, he is coming to bring his salvation apart from sin. As we, We're looking at the reconciliation with God. The ability to be back in a good relationship with the Father. That's what Jesus was doing in his life, in his death. But as we look at even the resurrection, but the second coming, as we see what is taking place there, as Jesus comes back, he's accomplishing salvation apart from sin. In Hebrews chapter 9, 27 through 28, the Hebrew writer says, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who, eager, who are eagerly waiting for him. That's what the second coming is going to accomplish. It's going to accomplish salvation for those who are awaiting Christ. This is very heavy in some of the, the ways in which we look towards what is being talked about in the second coming because it's, it's an ending of all things as we know it. But it is a message of hope to those who believe, to those who have a relationship with Christ. And when it comes to salvation... Peter makes this, this statement. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. When it comes down to it, salvation is only found within Christ. But that is the Christ in whom we serve. That is the Christ in which our hope is based around. One who had decided to live a perfect life. Who had decided to come down and live as a man in general. To bring us salvation. Who was willing to die to suffer. To bring us salvation. Who is risen again. Who is up in heaven. Telling us that we as well will have the opportunity to dwell with him there. And who will come and take us to his father, to that dwelling place, when he comes again. This becomes some of the most basic principles within our faith as Christians. As those who look towards Christ. These Again, I will make this statement have heavy connotations because there is salvation in no one else. There is no other way to receive salvation and deliverance from what is to come if not found in Christ. Now, we know that. I believe that if not all of us, most of us here are well aware of that fact. But here's the reality of it as we need to go through, and we need to be ready to give that defense, but we also need to put ourselves in a position where we actually express our hope. We should be sharing our hope with others. I don't think any of us wants to see tragedy in any of this befall our neighbor, our friends, our family. After my lesson last week, and I had made the statement in which I pulled up the graphic. I should have set that up again here now that we see so frequently with the, with the pie chart. That is asking the question whether or not we can know 
or if we think about whether or not we're going to heaven. It's expressing our need to get out there and offer that information to somebody. And my kid told me, he gives me a message, he says, about 70% of those who are, in the, who are considered unchurched have never been invited to church. There's a song with a really sad uh, tone to it, which is, you've never mentioned him to me. And it's a beautiful song with a very serious message. Which says, you saw me day by day and you showed me not the way. You never mentioned him to me. I don't think any of us want to have that being told to us. When the time comes and somebody's saying, you know, I didn't even know that you were faithful. In all our interactions, you never invited me to church. So that's where I end with us for today do we make the attempt to reach out to offer that to those who are dearest to us and those who are near us that maybe they can share in this awesome hope that we have founded in Christ join me in prayer Heavenly Father Lord I'm grateful once again for another opportunity to come to you in worship Another opportunity to look to you as the creator of all things and absolutely worthy of our devotion and praise. We ask you at this time that you continue with us through our week and as we look upon you to strengthen us in our times of need, you also encourage us as we deal with those who are around us that we may be able to inform them of the hope that is found in you and in your son, that we may be able to have the strength to speak up about you in our lives. Lord, we know that that is your earnest desire that all would come to repentance and we ask that you help us in accomplishing that goal. As well, we ask that you be with us that we may be able to stay strong in the faith. Lord, it's in your son's name that we pray in all this. Amen. Joyful, joyful. Bulletin suggested that he's going to be in rehab first. 
several weeks. So any any warning to this, um, or he'd like to talk to you, or or that type of thing. I already ordered a book for him on on Kansas State, <laughs> but he probably has every book. So so um, uh, pray for Bill because um, I'm sure he doesn't want to be um, there. I asked Veronica about Maggie May, the baby that had the feeding tube. Um, she's better, so I'm glad we prayed about that and Veronica asked us to. Um, so she's at home now and the feeding tube has um, um, been removed, but continue to pray for that baby because um, whatever the reason is that she's not eating well, or it might be removed. Charlie and Haiti, we know that fell again. Um, I think the bulletin says she fell in the same place that she fell before, so it's even, even darker blue than it was before. But um, uh, pray for her in the place she's away. She's also, um, well, not today, but collecting a gift basket for Michael, um, who's in Kuwait. Uh, for a gift basket, and what was the thing, tree nuts? That's, I guess, what he asked for, the tree nuts. So, so we'll all have to go home and say, okay, I know there's almonds. <laughs> what, else, what, what else is a tree nut? Not peanuts. Huh? Oh, okay. I was going to say those are in ground. Uh, um, Also in um, surgery camp, um, Roy Bell let us know that uh, Jason was able to have a surgery where, and Jason, you know, suffers from uh, numerous seizures, epileptic seizures, and they, uh, at times get, you know, much, he's, he's, he's one that has significant number of seizures. Anyway, this doctor at Kaiser in LA has offered this surgery to many people. In fact, he does them on a free basis. I don't know if that was Jason's case, but they implanted what's called a vagus nerve stimulator. And um, the doctor's been doing a number of these surgeries actually in Ukraine uh, recently. And so um, hopefully that, that device, which is implanted in his chest, uh, will help him uh, overcome these seizures from um, his epilepsy. And then finally, um, Monica Ethel um, suffered or went had to go to the ER for her blood pressure. So I'm sure that's why she's uh, she's not in the ER. She's at home, correct? Okay. Okay, so she's not um, she's not doing well. So please uh, pray for her. And then on the you know, you'll remember a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, that um, a gentleman spoke to us about a play, um, an organization called Labs to Leaders, and he we gave him twenty minutes, but his presentation is actually on forty five minutes. So. Originally, Tanya, I think, was the one that brought it up about a, a Zoom meeting, and that Zoom meeting is still occurring on Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 19th. So, um, if that's something you want to continue to, to get the full hear the full presentation, that's will be on a Zoom meeting, so you don't have to you don't have to go to it just home in Florida or wherever you live. <laughs> so, yes, Patty. I haven't got to that part of the announcement. You go to 94,000, no. <laughs> and then you go Zoom. No, in just a minute. So um, also, Sherry and I donated a walker that was, uh, that her dad used. And it's, I think it's pretty new, but uh, you're welcome to, I'm gonna put it in the, that room and you're welcome 
to have it, or um, if you have a friend that needs a walker, um, uh, please take it. Okay, the 94,000. I was kidding about the Zoom, but if you want to know about the Orange Key Church, uh, you can message the 94,000 like it's the phone number, and then you put in the word Orange View, or you put in the word OB Weekly to get a copy of the bulletin, or the word OB Comp Card for you know communication with the church, prayer requests, things like that. And then if you've got somebody that wants to find out more about Christianity, um, it says, OB, I'm ready. So it's all goes to 94,000. But um, like for instance, if you, did, if you didn't know about the Zoom meeting on Wednesday, you could use the comp card to say, hey, could you tell me uh, how to access that? And then we would get back to you. But he's already on top of that. So, uh, but just as an example, if you didn't know. Or like, I'm lazy sometimes. When I call my sister to find out whose phone number is where. You know, it's like, what am I, the directory assistant? <laughs> it's like you can look it up yourself. But nevertheless, um, we help each other out. As a, uh, the Bible studies during the week, again, Tuesdays, the online study with, with um, Kevin at 6.30. Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Um, here at the church uh, building, there's a study on Luke. And then um, Thursdays at 10 a.m. at Patty Woodside's home. And that's on the survey of the Bible. Again, these are e emailed directly to Michael or Kevin if you want to send your prayer request to them. And this is just to remind us that that big blue swab, the piece of the pie, are people that have never, don't know what church is, that they're unchurched. They've never heard about the Bible, or don't know who Jesus is, or you know who knows what, but they're, they say they're ignorant of, of um, what, what the Bible is all about. So there's a large body of people that haven't heard from us. So um, all right. Did I miss anything? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we're we're grateful that that you're aware of us and that um, our prayers are heard and we know we can be confident that you answer them. And that it is best for us that your will be done. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen.